All right. Good Welcome. evening. I'm, I, I'm uh, Kirsten Bradley. I'm in the uh, Hampton Roads, Virginia area. I'm a retired high school English teacher, and now I'm teaching um, adjunct at two local universities. Um, I'm very familiar with this topic, and I actually worked with Hannah um, at the College oh of God. William & Mary. So, <laughs> yes. So you Thank introduced you. the topic for us. That's great. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know you're gonna no. Welcome, Debbie. Are you there? You're there, but your camera has disappeared. And when you get back, you'll introduce yourself. And Jess came back. And, and cool, cool, Jess. You want to introduce yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, good. I, I had to go out and come back. I always have issues. I'm Jess Early. I'm uh, at Arizona State University and a writing project director for Central Arizona Writing Project. Yeah, there is. Cool, cool. Andrea. I'm Andrea Zellner, and I'm here in Oakland County, Michigan, so you know where that is, and um, affiliated with Red Cedar Writing Project in I used to um, adjunct at ASU myself, so online <laughs> from Michigan. <laughs> you have a lot of our MSU faculty moved to ASU. Cool. Marina, um, you want to move down to a seat? Welcome. Do you want to, and then quickly introduce yourself? Are you walking at the same time? That's very clever. And Christina, you want to move around a little bit too off the center. Yeah. Okay, what were the directions? Just introduce yourself. Hi, Welcome. I'm Marina. I am a third grade general education teacher in Sleepy Hollow, New York. And today was my first day just with teachers. Wait, you first day just with teachers, not yeah. kids yet? like superintendent conference day, yeah. Cool, cool. Debbie, I see you moving around. Do you want to introduce yourself? Um, Great. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. Is that... What you oh, wanted? is that no? Oh. I don't. My camera is supposed to be on. I can oh, see you, I, I can Debbie. See you. Oh, I okay. Can see you, Debbie. Um, so it's I'm Debbie Avalok, <laughs> and I work with a group of librarians at a San Francisco Unified, and have been uh, thinking about how to approach AI with them, given everything that's been going on. So that's cool. Christina, you're the last. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christina Cantrell. I work for the National Writing Project. And yeah, excited for the conversation. So I will say this, that um, Christina sent me a link to um, Anna Franz's book. And um, I've been reading it and playing with it. And um, some of the other um, students write to their own writing. And then I was talking to Bonnie Bentham, who we hope is going to appear here as well. Um, a, uh, she's going to be teaching 11th graders this year, teacher at uh, SLA at Bieber in Philadelphia. And she has her own stories about uh, learning herself about correcting or not correcting. <laughs> African-American students, but not only African-American students, other students in their classroom as well, in their work. Um, so she and, I said, she and I said to her to each other a few weeks ago, hey, we should, we should try to figure out how we could make some writing partners that would be linguistically um, inclusive. Um, so I want to present that. And then Hannah Franz is going to join us next week. So this is sort of like a getting ready, getting prepared um, kind of conversation, if that's okay with you. Um, and, and the first thing I'd like to do is kind of say what the problem is, if we could. And Kirsten, who didn't know he was going to do this, um, Kirsten, <laughs> do I have your pronoun correctly? They were going to do, sorry. Okay, didn't know he was going to do this. Um, said he's worked with um, Hannah Friends a little bit. So I'm going to throw it to you. What's the issue <laughs> as you see it? Or give us some background. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, I I worked um, when I 
was in Norfolk Public Schools with the College of William and Mary through their CERN program and with Dr. Ann Charity Hudley and and so forth. And um, she is uh, she is now at Stanford, um, and she a lot with linguistics and community and what have you. And I actually had the opportunity to uh, work with her and Hannah um, as part of the manuscript when she was putting it together. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, um, and if you're familiar with the C's uh, statement on students' right to their own language and the whole April Baker Bell movement of, you know, students should have um, right to how you know, they're, of course, they're talking specifically about African American Englishes and other languages as well. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly in the college classroom um, with this whole juxtaposition of standardized and correct quote unquote English uh, versus other Englishes that students speak, um, you know, whether or not it's correct. I don't know the whole historical context, but um, one of the wonderful things about her book is that she has a lot of practical things on how um, professors and teachers can actually look at um, language, different language use and context and not just, um, you know, informally or um, a, you know, for students to communicate with each other, to help students to, or to uh, help teachers and educators understand how um, they can understand to help students use their different languages in the context of different circumstances and situations. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. No, that's cool. cool. <laughs> that is, know, but sorry. yes. Um, yeah, feel free is, to interrupt is, and kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely um, something needed. And what I like, I haven't seen the final um, book, but I know that she um, did a lot of work, Hannah did as part of her dissertation in working with um, different professors and how students were graded um, for a lot of incorrectness and of understanding that educators understand that African-American English is, um, is an actual language. Um, and it's something that students don't know about. I know I always take the time to um, educate my um, freshman composition students um, on African American English so that they understand the origin, the historical context, and that it's not just something that's slang or not understood. So I'm interested to see how the AI piece plays into all of this. Bonnie, welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself? And Bob Montgomery, welcome too. You could introduce yourself. Have a minute. Why don't we start with Bob? Hi, folks. Uh, I'm just excited to engage with you about the ways in which we can preserve and protect the human voice in in uh, in this new future wave of AI tools. And um, I know at Westhead, where I work, there are many people who are worried about that. And um, can you, can you say say a little more? Expand on that. What what is the word? Because uh, we're trying to establish the problem here. First. I'll, I'll just say it's primarily from a creative and personal writing standpoint, not from a work writing standpoint or other types of writing, but from a creative and personal standpoint. Um, the concern is, and I can speak from a family perspective. My son has struggled with the temptation. Is that it's just so <laughs> convenient and easy to to get the struggle, to avoid the struggle of writing, to avoid the pain and suffering that is part of writing um, when you have a tool that can take care of that for you. And so for, for, for folks who are inclined and young people are, can often fit this bill, inclined to, to seek an easy way out because they don't necessarily know better, um, this is a temptation that is often hard to resist um, and so I'm just wondering, how do we protect the struggle and the work that is required for good writing experiences? <clears throat> that, and that's what, my, that's what my colleagues are sharing. Yeah, and I would say to add to that, it was a question I had wondered early on um, about African-American languages in particular as it relates to AI by further promoting the use of standardized English. Um, yes. Because certainly, you know, students use AI as a thought partner or what have you, um, there's probably not going to be, and with, you know, somebody put something in 
you know, that is using that zero color or negative, it is going to correct that and standardize that, you know, further promoting um, the correct, if you speaking, versus um, other ways that students speak and communicate. Everybody, feel free to jump in as you as you go here. Aditya, welcome. Bonnie, do you want to say what you think? How do you how you're seeing all this? At the, just at the beginning. Here. Hi, well, everybody. I, I introduced you already, but you could do it again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, of course, I, I teach at Science Leadership Academy at Beaver, and I see it's in the write up for today's t this evening's session. Um, it, I started talking to Paul about this topic um, that. I didn't want my students' voices to be lost in what artificial intelligence thought should be said. Mm. And also in its thinking, um, when I think about Grammarly and even sentence by sentence, um, when um, there is there are um, edits that are made, whose voice is the edit coming under? And I used to um, be a co-instructor with, with Temple University professors in the journalism program. And one professor, she would even step on my English teacher toes and say, do not change student voice all the time. But, you know, I come from that um, English world, the, the generation before <laughs> that would make all these changes, heavy changes to student senate sentences to make it correct or politically correct as to the standardization of language of the moment. And I no longer do that. And so looking at um, AI, uh, I, don't, I, I don't want students to feel, um, because they're made to feel less than when these um, devices change so much of what it is they've had to say. So this is a really important topic to me and I'm glad I'm here. Others, just sort of go around. What are you thinking as we get started here? I mean, I, I just like popped in the end of the conversation, right? But what I, from what I heard, it kind of reminded me of what ended up happening when I was writing my piece last year uh, yeah. last year, which is that um uh ai just I, I created a writing partner that i mean i was given a writing partner that just directly edited my piece and then i kind of felt like like i compared the two pieces side by side the one before when i edited with ai and then the one after where like a couple sentences were edited here and there and to me it was kind of pretty obvious which pieces were edited edited by ai and i kind of realized that that's probably not what i want to do when i want to use ai to improve my writing so instead, um, when I started to use AI to revise different pieces, I would uh, ask it not specific places to improve, like, okay, replace this word in this sentence, but rather, okay, look, analyze my piece as a whole, and then it tell, tell me what I'm missing. Like, oh, maybe a little bit more coverage on this topic. Maybe you're spending too much time discussing this topic rather than, and then I get to rewrite it with my own voice rather than what AI thinks is best. Yeah, I, I, I just over time, and I can't actually recount where the pieces are, but um, I know I've heard students present about their work using AI, and both having this critique that, you know, my voice isn't there, or I didn't like how it rewrote that thing. So I, you know, and then also, but then also sort of taking on the critique or taking on the like, well, they, AI made it so much more acceptable or sound so much better that I, it, you know, so from like a power dynamic that now this could be used for college entrance exams or something like that, you know, so, um, and I know Jess is here. So it's sort of that like, like these power dynamics of language Mm -hmm. I've heard the conversations students really they'll start. I mean, I'd, it'd be interesting to like, how do you have more of those conversations? 
I want to also sort of say that Kirsten um, or Kirsten, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but um, the <laughs> your your piece about context, I feel like, is so important, um, and that's this that's what we can really lose in these automated ways. So I just wanted to this idea about context is interesting to me. So just wanted to say that too. I guess I have a question, Paul, Go for, for you. Okay. Um, you know how when you were giving instructions to AI, um, one mm -hmm. of them turned out to be when a student speaks to you in another language, respond to them in that language. Mm -hmm. How would you revise that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we tend to still put that up. I mean, it's it's sort of a, um, a second language question more than anything. Like if, if a student is wanting to get response in Spanish, they sort of have a right to get response in Spanish, it seemed to us. How would we revise that with this perspective in mind? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't call it, a, I don't think you call it a language or even a dialect, but you would might, might call it um, a tone and tone and voice or something like that, which I mean, I wonder what AI would do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I say something? Yes, kind jump of? in, yes. Folks, so, keep jumping in, please. I, maybe I'm out there, but this is something I think that makes, I think one of the gifts of being a human writer is that we have voices. And maybe there are some things that AI can't do for us. And I would not want AI to take my voice away or to replicate it. In all my research around college admission essay and secondary writing, especially high stakes genres like college admission essay where you're showing your self through writing and a story, voice is so important. And it's so, you're, like 90% of stories are about people's mothers, college admission essays. And they always say, like, don't write about your mother. But if your mother is important, you should write about your mother, but write about it from your voice and your perspective and your story. And AI can't do that. So I don't know. I'm a, I, I don't actually want AI to take people's voices and replicate it. And I think more than anything, what you're saying would all of, like, is making me think in new ways about how, oh, we can't just assume this is fixing and helping and making better. It 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 can be taking away, um, and it can also be negating people's not just their voice but their ling you know their linguistic, cultural, ethnic background. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know if that's just no, a complete like no, but no, no, I can't. Like, okay. so like what what's better about this and what isn't better. I'm going to jump in and talk yeah. about the cultural and ethnic background. What's happening is who is feeding, who's leading the charge in feeding this intelligence to be used by masses of people? And um, whose voices are they he hearing? Even when we think about our phones and our devices and you have Siri, Alexa, I, and I, I say to the students, ask Siri, Alexa, Google in them. I mean, that question is just so elementary for me. You shouldn't yeah. ask me that question. But think about the voice that tells them, gives them a response. So, you know, like I, I have an iPhone, so it has four different voice choices to choose mm -hmm. from. Um, and I usually try to choose a voice even that sounds more like my voice, my tone, just like you say. And, and so we're at where what we're doing with writing partners is so much more highly sophisticated than Siri, Alexa, Google in them. <laughs> with those very basic uh, call and responses, question and responses. But how I don't know. Black people now are talking about feeding these these intelligences 
so we're not left out again. Yeah, there is definitely um, can be a gate, another gatekeeper um, <laughs> from, you know, different languages and discourses. Um, it, it certainly perpetuates, again, the narrative of correctness and which language in language of varieties are, um, you know, correct and appropriate. Um, and which is why I think it's important for students to understand that. I don't, I don't think that they should not use AI, but I think, you know, to take it at chapter and verse, understand that you're not just, you know, appropriating your thoughts to um, something else or to, you know, a machine, but you're also um, in some ways diminishing, like you all said, your voice, um, who you are um, as a communicator. So it's, it goes way beyond that. And I think that's an extra layer that needs to um, really be added into this whole AI literacy thing. I mean, I, um, one of the colleges that I teach at, they're, they're big on AI literacy. because I, I can't use it unless I know about it. And the students can't use it intelligently unless they know about it as well. But to understand um, how, you know, it can be a, a gatekeeper and to further perpetuate these, um, these biases that um, occur in our language, especially um, in the academic space. Uh, I just, this is sparking so much for me. Early in my career, so I started teaching in 2001 or something around there. So it's been a minute. And uh, I started working in a predominantly black community. And uh, I remember feeling so acutely that um, discomfort of correction of my students as an English teacher. And I was in conflict with some of the other adults in the building because I was trying to do all this stuff around voice, but I was also a white person in that space. And my colleagues were saying things to me like, you're preventing them from having access to the language of power if you don't teach them the standardized ways of speaking. And I think that's like a really interesting, um, not to crack or like to figure out our way through. I. I think what April, Dr. April Baker Bell is doing, and I'm excited about Hannah Franz's work as well, has been so eye-opening, but also it's not part of the K-12 conversation in the same way that it's been hitting higher ed. Um, and there's still some of this tension around how we handle the, the which like I, there's a really great article called Grammar is a Ponzi Scheme that was in Lit Hub a few years ago. And I flipping love that article. And anytime we talk about it, I just always see grammar the Ponzi scheme. And uh, that to me is kind of where this convert this like this really big tension is. And also I'm working with English learners right now. And one of uh, my students is 29 and a newcomer. And his desire to get the grammar right also is like this other tension because I I'm of this opinion, like, if, if we understand you, it's all fine. I just want to, you know, make sure that you can navigate the world and be understood. But he is very focused on the grammar. And that's like a really important part of his acquisition of language. So I don't know what to what I'm just spinning on it a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to name those tensions. <laughs> You know, Bob, uh, when he was initially talking, he um, referred to voice in the context of creative personal writing. But what I'm hearing is not that. I'm hearing and I believe that we can hear voice in anything a student writes, not just their personal writing. So for example, when, when I look at National History Day um, papers, we, we're asked as a judge to look for student voice in the history paper. And so there's an example of a research paper in which there's an assumption that there will be a student voice. Right. And, and Marina, I wanna, you've been doing work around TED Talks as well, right? Just saying, and so TED Talks are another example of not necessarily personal writing or something, but you do need voice there as well. Yes. 
just trying to draw you in if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that from what I, my experience doing um, that type of work with the organization out in, in New York and then leading students with it is, I think this like drive for authenticity mm -hmm. um, and vulnerability and being yourself. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, I guess that All would right, be. Yeah. Let, me, um, let me try to frame what I think we're doing here. Could I do that? <laughs> And, um, and I'm going to refer to a research process that I think has uh, been um, brought to our attention recently, um, but um, cognitive task analysis, right? Where you stop and you say, and this is what I think we're actually doing kind of in some way um, when we build these writing partners. And I want to kind of see if we could kind of think about what, what that would be. And in cognitive task analysis, my understanding of it is, that you go figure out what experts know and how they how they tutor people, right? And you interview them, you kind of figure out all their, the ways they think about stuff, the decision-making they do, you record all of that, and then you can put it into a computer somehow, and um, that computer can do that for them. Or you can teach a, a um, novice mentor to, to act that way. Right? Very bad definition here. <laughs> Go with that. I think, I think, and, and Kirsten just jumped off. I hopefully he'll be able to come back. But I think that's part of what we're doing. We're, we're starting with these writing partners. We often start with some theoretical perspective. And we're going to do that with the linguistically inclusive approaches. Um, my goal, I think we also want to ask, and here's the key question that I think a lot of people around the table can ask. It can answer is what do we want teachers to say back to, to students? How do we want them to interact with a writer who is using Black English or whatever you'd want to call it? And can we capture those protocols, those ways of acting in a writing partner? And then when, then we would have a writing partner that would be sensitive to linguistic differences and know how to respond to it. Does that sound like worth doing? Can somebody suggest this? Talk back to me. Does that make sense to try to do that? Yeah, I like think? that. But also I have a question though. Didn't sure. I read that ChatGPT made it so you could feed it your own writing so it sounded like you? Does I think you know can, what I'm yeah, there, about? there is a version. That, yes, you can do something. Yeah, of that. but you have to like pay for I, it or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. No, so, I, but can we clarify? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, personally, I'm not so interested in the, the writing partner or the whatever, the bot to sound like our students necessarily. I want mm -hmm. the teacher. I want it to, to respond with the same kinds of thinking and decision-making mm. that a teacher would do mm -hmm. for that student. And they wouldn't necessarily adopt, you know, black English if, right? That's um, right. So you wanted to be talking back. So yeah. they'd say things like I would, like, like pretend you're at Starbucks talking to a friend or you're in the hall at your locker. They don't have lockers anymore, but like, or like, like when, uh, when you're the writing in, partner would say things to encourage them to use their voice. And me, I told students, I told students today, I, I use the word y'all a lot, even though you is singular, oh. singular and plural. I always say, come on, y'all. And and where do we see that? You know, and and I said, so what? And I had to break it down to him. I said, I made you all a contraction and so it has an apostrophe and i broke that whole thing down to them today so and then now paul you saying the expert i was like okay well who's the expert mm -hmm. and what do they sound like who is the expert what do they sound like and what are, are they giving or taking away from the writer because they're the expert well 
I don't know if that was a question to Paul, but as I was listening yeah, to you, I was thinking to myself, what would I need to know to give a student feedback on, on writing? And it seems to me that one thing that is really important in terms of voice is to find out the student's writing purpose. Because when we speak to each other, we say things in certain ways because we have an audience of a certain kind that we're communicating with. And so part of me says, if I was going to advise a, a, a writing partner, mm -hmm. I would want that writing partner to ask directly if a student gave the, a piece of writing to a writing partner, a human or not. So give me some context for this writing. Who, who is it for? Why are you, you know, something. Because then as a writing coach or a person giving feedback, I would be able to say, can the person or people that you're writing to understand what you're saying if if you're saying it in a certain way and that's part of what voice is is not just that you have voice but that you are creating a connection with an audience of some sort mm -hmm. i think that's all really helpful other other thoughts on what debbie just said Okay. <laughs> so keep us going here somehow, folks. We're 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 um I part of what what part of what is in Franz's book is indeed um a traditional approach assumes a white audience, right? And a a, a linguistically inclusive approach assumes there could be multiple audiences. So how do we create a writing partner or an AI being, right, that would would do that? We could you're saying they could ask directly what is your audience? I'm not sure a lot, a lot of students would know who their audience is, but that's I wrote that down. That's a that's a place to start. And how could the second part of that question, Paul, is and how can that be done without calling out calling all the um setting off all the alarms of you know all this cultural stuff this cultural bias stuff you know because if you ask the question how 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 will it play out in the psyche of the reader or the listener and, and what do they hear when that question is asked specifically by someone who may not look like them or even sound like them? Yeah, I got to say, Bonnie, you, you, me, I, when I said I don't want to create a writing partner that sounds like the students necessarily, I said something to that effect. I mean, that doesn't seem to go. You immediately jumped in and said, hey, I use, I use, you know, other ways of talking to my kids and then explain to them. So how you would talk to them and how I would talk to them is probably very different. So you complicated that already. But, but Paul, how yeah, about, yeah. I'm, I'm really, uh, you get really great results, even in the way you speak to them, even though we're very different. And I think they appreciate Mm -hmm. our differences in order for them. So the way I feed young people right now, everything I'm doing for you is for their your success. That's what I tell young people so that they can buy into whatever it is I'm saying, that I'm not trying to hurt them or harm them. I only want them to be elevated for their own lives and for the children that they have yet to have. So that's how I kind of... Um, 
make everything an even playing field. That's what I'm doing this week even, just making it an even playing field. So they know that the things that I say or what we do in the classroom might not um, be agreeable to them and it might feel like I'm getting on their nerves or something, but it's for their elevation. And, and thus me telling them, I say y'all all the time as an English teacher. I say y'all all the time, <laughs> y'all. I say gonna, even though it's supposed to be going to. Uh, which is, and then I'm like, um, which, but, but one of the things that I'm thinking about just listening is that um, one of the things I think that really good teachers, no matter who you are, do um, to do all the things that you're saying, uh, Bonnie, about lifting students up and supporting their success is giving them choices. So if the writing partner isn't just, and I think you already do this, it, what I've seen in writing partners, but like different ways of, different choices, different ways of responding. So there isn't this correct sense of, like I think a lot of yep. just good writing that gives students voice, gives students a sense that they can be who they are, comes from good writing invitations. Because I actually think not all writing does has voice and that we as a school, not in the National Writing Project, but as a public or a school system across the country, we have systematically taken voice out of writing. We have perpetuated genres like five paragraph essay um, and timed tests and AP, like that teachers are like, you can't use I. And um, so I, I actually think like the, a number one way of thinking about equity and voice and is it inviting choice in writing, inviting lived experience, inviting students to write in not formulaic canned kind of genres. Um, and then if you're a writing partner, if I had a person who's a writing partner, the kind of person I would want to honor mm -hmm. My diverse students. That's exactly the question we need to be asking. Yeah, right it would be someone who would um, respond by honoring what they I've said or read, and then to give me suggestions, but also choices. Like you could do, like so that it doesn't feel like, oh, you this is wrong or this is not said correctly or this is. Um, I don't know. That's just where my brain goes. I also wonder too, if there's an audience, I know we played with audience before with varying degrees of success. And I wonder if there's something, I totally agree with you choices. I, how many times have I said in a brand conference, I don't know, just play with it, you know, <laughs> just try it this way and try it that way and see which one you like. Um, but also this idea of audience, because as Paul was naming, like we assume this white audience, this, like I said before, the language of, of power and uh, that I, th I think we all know that you end up with better writing when it's more expansive than that. Um, at least we think so. That's where you really the magic happens. And there's so many examples of that in um, even our canonical literature. So I don't know, I'm just like thinking about so the whole I'm gonna, audience. I'm gonna try that, that feels useful. I'm going to try to synth synthesize or put together um, some of what Debbie said and some of what Jess said. And could, a writing partner could look at a paragraph and could say, hey, if your audience is a white audience of power, you, you'd want to do this. Mm. But if your audience is, is this other audience, and we could start to describe what that is, mm. you might want to write it like this, right? I mean, that, that feels a little complicated, but it, I think yeah, that's that feels possible. Yeah, I think that's really dangerous, actually. Okay. I don't actually <laughs> think there is an audience of there should not ever be an audience of white power. But just uh, think about it's um, really problematic. I I actually think that this is a misnomer that mm -hmm. 
you have to write for that audience because that's not, I, I know at my university, it's like the biggest university in the country and that's not who's reading college admission essays. Are mm -hmm. the people reading them are just as diverse as the student body and they mm -hmm. want to hear their languages and linguistics. So I, I, I don't actually think it's true. I think it's. So how could you reframe but that? that? What I was thinking as, you, as Andrea was talking, think about Spanish. They talk about the familiar and then the- that, I like that. Formal and you know, if we say it, if it's said in that way, everyone is safe because yeah. what's familiar for different cultures, different ethnicities, um, there's, there's a wide range of that, that I think just <laughs> using those two words leaves a, a big open door now that mm -hmm. we're talking about it. And and Andrea, you talk about the, the language of power. In my classroom, I say the king's English. <laughs> they have to Yeah, I mean, it's colonialism. I mean, it's really, it's like, it's really all baked in. And I, you know, I, I think it's important to make that visible because it is part, you know, making those invisible structures that are pushing on us are, it's so important and it's like, how do you make sure that that's an empowering conversation instead of a, a disempowering conversation? Because it can go either way. Uh, I think the best way to do that is to talk about, not the best, but a way, mm -hmm. is to talk about what the purpose of the writing is in a social yeah, context. So like, what is this so writing cool. doing? And that's kind of what you're saying, Bonnie. You know, is this a familiar genre? Like, is this, are you writing a letter to your grandma? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you could write y'all, or are you writing the letter to the, the senator right. in the state of Arizona who you want to, that's a different sense of familiarity and distance. And then <laughs> you talking about it takes a lot to get our students to play. And as soon as you said it out loud that way, I thought about the danger of standardized test. It has taken play out of learning, you know. It, 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 I mean, it has killed the joy of learning. Yeah, that's yeah. what that's yeah. what Goldie Muhammad has been asking us to do. You know, these these luminaries in our profession are inviting us to join and play. And just for a plug, UDL 3.0 is out. So if you need to talk about why joy and play is important, it's right in those guidelines for universal design. And so I think having the maybe a playful writing partner mm. here would open up some of it as well. Mm. So thinking about purpose, thinking about audience, thinking about play and choice, then we might get somewhere. And this is why my school is really good with all of these um, learning toys that we've been talking about, we've been creating and we've been um, uh, working with, with Paul, because that's the kind of school where I am. You know, testing is the last thing. And what we've learned is students are allowed to play. They're going to do well on the test. They'll do well on the test. So we don't even worry about it like that anymore because we see the outcome of the joy and the play and learning and how it plays out in a standardized test. Ruha Benjamin, um, if you all know who she is, she's all about you know, AI bias. She has a great book, um, her recent book, Imagination Manifesto, that talks about how um, imagination is um, only allowed to be used for certain people, and, you know, dream a little and think about how they can best communicate. Um, thank you, Andrea, for the article. Um, I, I, my Google Doc about the uh, grammar is the Ponzi. That's a great one. Uh, one of the things I do is I, um, this is my first week of school um, in one of my colleges, and I go over concepts, ideologies, and themes that prohibit students from learning. Like conceptually, a good writer, a good communicator is whatever, you know, and then what ideology center around that as to why, you know, you have to come in class and have a daily warm up on the board and, uh, you know, speak the King's English, as you say, to really just have the students think about that because they don't really think about that. And like you said, standardized tests 
um, have done a lot to kind of steal that joy, as Goldie Muhammad would say, away from learning, but for them to understand. Um, even things like how words are not the dominant way of communicating, that you know, our students today, especially live in a multi-literate society. Um, they're, you know, don't just use emojis, they use different images and ways to effectively and impactfully communicate. And they do the same thing with uh, language and creation as well. But just making them understand and being aware that there are a lot of ideologies that persist that um, greatly influence how education is delivered. And that includes um, standardization in terms of language, in terms of writing, even things like MLA format and all that, you know, what is the purpose of all of that? All right. So <laughs> in this book, right, that, that you're sitting right on top of, Kirsten, it's fine that you are. There are, there are lists of things, ways to recognize um, African-American um, language, right? And would we want an AI partner to, to be able to recognize that and to then do something different than correct it? It's kind of a leading question, but I don't know the answer. I, I don't, you know what I'm saying? So could we go, could we go, could we go through these lists and say, hey, that's a structure that is recognized as black English. I'm not going to correct that out of your out of your thing, out of your text here. This is what I'm going to do instead. And what would the instead be? I think one idea, Paul, yeah. is, is that instead is it is a conversation that a student could have with a thinking partner that is not evaluating, judging, or analyzing like the components of the writing, but rather um, asking questions and trying to help the writer um, through through ideas around how to expand their voice. So it's 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 not about the technical moves of writing that you're getting evaluated on. I guess what I'm wondering is, is what do we think is the most productive role for a writing partner mm. when voice and confidence and imagination and all the kind of affective aspects are so critical that, you know, the, back to the joy um, and, the, and the struggle, but the emotional experience of writing, it just feels like we need a coach that's asking questions and giving ideas and choices and validation and letting the learner kind of own the the, step, the next steps. So I just I just put a piece of my writing in chat GPT and I said, how can I um, give me ideas for um, uh, kind of in, enhancing my voice? And it gave me choices mm -hmm. and specific activities and really creative things to experiment with without any feedback other than to say, you know, you're, what a great thing to try to do to develop your voice. So I think that's what would be fun to try to, to, to develop as a writing partner that can create a conversation with a student that gives them ideas for things that they can try. And Paul, to your question, I can't repeat that question, but what came to mind for me was call and response. Yeah. And so call and response. And, and then to top that off, repetition. Yeah. Um, and, and especially when you talk about in, in, in a lot of communities of color, is call and response, is the way in which people communicate with one another. But how often do we do that in writing? We, we don't necessarily do that. But that's how people learn how to understand one another in certain communities. They even learn how to respect one another in certain communities through call and response and the repetition of the word, whether it be written or spoken. Mm. So is, is that something you think you can do when you're writing a comments on a student's paper? Yes. 
How? Sometimes. Um, so I'll write, uh, look, what are some of the words? Like I'll, I'll write on there, they'll say something and I might say, do that with an exclamation point. And, and or I'll, I'll write when they do something really well and I shouldn't probably write it, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway. You did the dang thing, you know, things <laughs> like that. And then they'll come back, oh, well, now they're saying Dr. Bentoon, they did make the switch. Oh, Dr. Bentoon. But uh, anyway, things like that, just to keep it, like, keep it alive. And that, and that I'm not like the, the know-all, see-all, be-all in the room to keep, you know, not to be that, even though I get the paycheck, I tell them. <laughs> it does seem like one of the, there's two things, like one I'm hearing is we want a writing partner that's giving us feedback that's authentic, like that's not corrective, but is th the feedback has voice. And sounds mm. playful. And then when I think about a writing partner, it's someone who's moving my writing forward. Mm. And sometimes, and this is research based, like what we need is to just have someone to feel heard and to feel read. And the act of, and that's something I've witnessed with in this space and in other spaces, is just even though it's a computer thing, the fact that they, you feel like someone's read your piece and, and you're getting a response at all is really powerful. Mm -hmm. But then if that response could be also playful or authentic, like Bonnie's saying, um, like you nailed it, or you, but. If, Maybe that's where like linguistic choice comes in, playful, yeah. formal. Um, but then most importantly for me is I want ways of moving forward. And that's what Bob's saying, like that he just got like some ideas, what I could do that you, you maybe hadn't thought of before. Um, and that's why when I have students work in groups and they get pure response, they're not just, they're getting their, Piece, and I think actually this is a kind of call and response, but instead of an orality in written, like you're getting someone, you're getting your piece read, then you're getting a response to it in writing and an oral response. Um, and then the goal is that once you get those things, you're getting to read other people's and you're getting ideas that'll move you forward. What is, I, I'm going to push back a little bit or think about this a little bit. Terry, Terry um, Elliot, months ago, created a um, a writing partner, and it's it's one of the five that I've chosen to you know to give to everybody, and it's uh, it's a it's a, a improv partner, right? And what it does is it reads what you've written or or any, any piece, and it totally agree. It's a, it's yes and right. And it's a pretty simple thing. It's yes and, and it does, it, it keeps you going. And it works pretty well as a, as a conversation for my own writing. I use it all the time to kind of just bounce stuff back and forth. I know it's going to be friendly. I know it's going to be pushing. It's going to stay with who I am, right? However, um, I also heard, and here's what I want to ask a little harder. I heard Kirsten at the beginning say that he teaches his students what African American vernacular English is and understanding what that is. So I think there might be a moment when a writing partner could say, hey, do you know that you just use this here? And that that is something that's not something to be ashamed of or be afraid of, but it's something to celebrate in some way. So could we do that, too, is what I'm asking. And I know that's a big question, but or is that too much? Are you are you um, if you're if it was a real tutor, mm -hmm. I think what the real tutor would do is the kind of thing where you check for understanding and you um, ask if that was the intention of what was written.
That feels useful. Yeah, we could do that. I don't know. I think other directions having yeah. you just said sounds uncomfortable to me, but I don't mm -hmm. know if I'm just for, because unless the partner is like, it feels like a call out sort of like, I notice you're using that. Whereas a lot of my students are, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what would be a, way of honoring without calling out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my goal here tonight, we've gotten to the goal, which is like, this is not easy. And, and I don't think making, making a computer that can, can do this is not going to be easy. But I I don't I don't want to give up on it. I think it's I think it's worth um I think it's worth flipping the idea that you know AI is going to smash our students' voice. I think we might be able to use AI to encourage the playfulness, the joy, and the voice that um that we're looking for. And part of that part of that is you know your 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 mother's tongue right in in the but maybe that's a framework that starts mm -hmm. the writing partner rather than a call out in response to the writing maybe it's like in this using this genre or writing what we're we honor lived experience we honor your home languages and um you know don't let the writing part don't ever feel like a response if you ever feel like it's shutting you down, I don't know, something like that. Do you see what I'm saying? Rather than a specific, like if I'm writing, I all of a sudden get like, you sound like you're from rural America and I'm not. Or, I, I you know what I mean? I'd be like, F you, I'm not like, you don't actually know me <laughs> or I don't know. Like, yeah, I, yeah. but I think it's more of a framework. See what you're saying is rightly so, you don't want AI to label. Mm -hmm. That's different than having AI respond as if it was human. You respond to the um, intention behind, maybe a possible intention behind the words, and do it in terms that are I mean, you use language that's conditional, you know, not mm -hmm. um, language that you obviously are saying. You want to say, I think I might hear. You know, you want to use that kind of conditional language as you would if you were a real human tutor and you were respecting that this person had done some work and was had shared it with you in a spirit of trust. And I think that goes back to Bonnie's thing. Bonnie, you, you said early on that you and Paul are in the same room and yet the students, I, I don't remember what, exactly what you said, but it was trust both of us. And see, mm -hmm. that's really the part of what has to happen in terms of the language that the AI uses. It has to build that trust. Hmm. All right. I <laughs> I think I, I, I think we're making progress. I hope you do too. Anyone sort of uh, go around with final thoughts or for tonight. Um, and then we'll continue this next week with Hannah Franz. Um, and if you can get a hold of the book, that'd be great to do. I'm going to ask her if I can put some of Chapter Four up, by the way, which is um, right. which is about um, commenting on student work. Uh, so we'll go a little deeper that way. So other people with your thoughts at this point, though, if you'd like to jump in. Aditya, you've been sitting there quiet tonight. Let me call on you. 
I mean, see, the thing with voice is that everyone's going to have their own experience with it. It's a, obviously a very nuanced topic. And I think that at a fundamental level, it's important to preserve our own voices. Uh, so I feel like this is something that's it's, it's definitely going to require some thought and it's going to take uh, a bit of, we have, we have to kind of just think about everything and its implications. Yeah, I agree with that um, because there are so many um, how females speak, if you're from Appalachia, all kinds of things that um, need to be considered in the AI space. Who, um, yeah, go ahead. I haven't said much, so I just thought I'd jump in, but there's something, Jess, when you're talking about like lived experience, I so one question I just have is like, how do we invite lived experience in, uh, or or I liked what you and Bonnie were talking about, like familiar versus, or like how do, what do we do with those kind of things um, given the context, so. I don't know, I'm just like playing with those in my mind. Right. I think it's interesting too, the voice happens in a relationship and that gets that call and response and, and, and the yes and kind of dialogic creation process. And I don't know, that's as far as that thought goes, but, but, but like thinking about it as a relationship and, and mm -hmm. you know, Bonnie, when you said, you know, I spend the first week of school, it, it, you know, showing the students that I'm working for their success. And that's that builds that trust that builds like can an AI do that? And, and can an AI build that relationship wherein 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 learning happens, wherein voice is developed in a dialogue, in a dialogic, in a in a, you know, by having a mental model of your reader and your diversity, your your inner diversity and your diver the diversity of your readers. I don't know. It's interesting to think of the potential here for that. Cool. <laughs> All right, Bob's off to build his own um, writing partner. Great, uh, <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, just just a quick mention that, that we we're trying to think about um, making stuff more obvious on writing partners. You'll see there's now a just a, a place when you first open it up. There's a, a the the writing box is right there. And then there are five that everybody gets. So play around with those five. I think some of them um, do what we were just saying here. Okay. Play around with the, um, you know, so I encourage you to kind of go in and mess mess around and, and we'll keep going here. And I'll, yeah, Bonnie and I will come up with something and we'll come back to you all. <laughs> Thank you for a rich conversation. Thanks so much, guys. And we'll talk to you next week. This is great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Night, night, everyone. <laughs>